Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. It's a nice sunny day. And uh, it's an interesting uh, subject that we are talking about today, both this morning and this afternoon, very interconnected uh, topics. And uh, as you will see uh, at the beginning of my presentation, I wanted to tell you just uh, very shortly about the uh, area of our work because I think it's very important to see the interconnectedness between legal capacity, community living, and uh, also prevention of torture and ill treatment uh, against persons with disabilities. So uh, what we are doing in Serbia and also what is uh, uh, what are activities of disability rights international worldwide include uh, work with advocates and especially what in Serbia we are focused on legal capacity reform, uh, also community living and the institutionalization uh, and torture prevention. Uh, you will notice that I wrote here, great push, but be careful. The reason we are focusing on torture prevention is that prevention from torture it is absolute, it, and it doesn't uh, allow any progressive realization. So uh, if we argue that people are actually victims of neglect, victims of torture in closed settings, especially if they are deprived of their legal capacity, then we have a great argument to ask for immediate action to stop such abuses. Nonetheless, uh, we have to be very careful and later in my presentation I will show you what uh, some uh, intervention by uh, bodies, international bodies for prevention of torture had as a consequence in Serbia for not really uh, giving precise recommendations, which then can result actually in further investments in institutions or uh, massive deprivation of legal capacity of people who are already detained in institutions. Uh, regarding current leg legislation in Serbia, we don't have really good re legislation. It's actually a very bad one. Uh, and the uh, issue is regulated not only by one, but uh, multiple uh, laws. The biggest part is regulated by two laws, which is law on non-contentious proceedings and uh, uh, family law that actually regulate procedure of deprivation and also appointment of a guardian. Uh, procedure uh, is regulated by the law on non-contentious proceedings and appointment of a guardian is separate and it's administrative procedure which is actually uh, regulated under the family law. We also have one institute which is called uh, uh, extension of parental rights uh, and it is somehow misinterpreted that it's a, it is the best solution. In fact, uh, extension of parental rights has the same consequences of, as deprivation of legal capacity, except it is the procedure that is done before a person uh, reaches the age of 18 in case of Serbia, before it reaches maturity. In that way, person is actually prevented of reaching maturity. And that's what actually extension of parental rights means. Uh, also, uh, different aspects uh, and of uh, enjoyment of legal capacity is regulated through different laws. And I will go through this uh, when I talk a little bit about consequences that deprivation of legal capacity has on people's lives in Serbia. Uh, current legislation in Serbia allows for three institutes. As I already mentioned, one of them is extension of parental rights, but it actually allows for two options uh, when we come to court procedure of deprivation of legal capacity. And that is uh, total deprivation, which results with plenary guardianship, and that is 
in a, a situation when a person is incapable of normal reasoning and therefore unable to care independently for his or her own rights and interests. And with such procedure, uh, a person who is deprived of uh, own legal capacity, totally, is uh, equal to a younger minor, that is, a person younger than 14 years of age. There is also an option for partial deprivation, and the condition for such partial deprivation is that a person directly threatens his or her own rights and interests or the <coughs> rights and interests of other persons. And in that case, the person is somehow equal to an older minor, which is a person uh, between 14 and 18 years of age. What is uh, good about this is that, for example, a person can get employment, but this is only if the court procedure is done appropriately and if, only if uh, there are very clear guidelines on what this person is actually allowed to do on his or her own and what are the restrictions that are coming out of the court decision. So some of the consequences, I said that uh, really issue of legal capacity is spread out through many laws in Serbia that regulate different areas of one's life. And among else, a person is unable to choose place of residence, uh, unable to exercise parental rights. That means that children are taken away from people who are deprived of their legal capacity. They cannot enter in, into contracts, gain citizenship. They cannot even volunteer. We very recently had a law on volunteering which explicitly, explicitly forbids volunteering even for persons who are partially deprived of their legal capacity. So you can see really how long and how, how vast the impact of the privation of legal capacity uh, is on people's life in Serbia. Uh, what we did, because we saw that the practice definitely wasn't good, because we were approached by many people, uh, we knew about uh, abuses that were going on, so we really wanted to see uh, what is going on, and we wanted to have black and white, we wanted to have an evidence, something with deprivation of legal capacity is really wrong. So what we did, we uh, run a, a survey, we actually collected uh, over 1,000 of core decisions that we analyzed because we wanted to see what are the basics, uh, what were uh, arguments, and what was the impact on persons' lives uh, when they were sub, uh, how to say, when they were, uh, when a procedure for legal capacity deprivation was uh, brought uh, against them. So uh, what we presumed from our experience and also from experience of people who were uh, personally uh, affected by, by this issue is that we presume that although the law allows for uh, partial deprivation, partial deprivation is actually very rare, that giving uh, people's legal capacity back is especially rare, uh, that procedure is not fully respected, and that the deprivation of legal capacity is simply based on diagnosis, and thus is completely discriminatory. Uh, we use the request for information for public interest, which is a law that allows civil society and all other actors to uh, ask for information from the state, uh, which we believe is of public interest. And we received decisions from 34 basic courts and 26 supreme courts. And we defined certain parameters that we did analysis uh, upon. So what we were actually looking for is what were the reasons? What was the justification? 
what was the history of a person, whether the person was institutionalized or not, uh, whether the court uh, ever saw a person that they decided uh, on which legal capacity they decided on. So here are some of the results. Main causes of deprivation were actually just uh, having a disability. So in 45% of all cases, the reason for deprivation of legal capacity was simply that a person has intellectual disability. In 31%, the reason was psychosocial disability. In 4%, the reason was physical disability. We mentioned something yesterday that it's not only persons with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities, persons with cognitive disabilities, they suffer from this because of this procedure, but actually we see that simply because of having a physical disability person were deprived of legal capacity, the rest were, like they say, combined disabilities or multiple disabilities that I didn't list here. So in 99% of cases, type of disability was specifically stated, usually in the form of medical diagnosis. What is also interesting, and it tells us about very close link between uh, segregation, institutionalization, and deprivation of legal capacity, that more than half, which is 57% of people deprived of their legal capacity have been institutionalized, either during the procedure or some, sometime in their lifetime. So out of those persons, 4% of them were involuntarily hospitalized. What was also very striking is that in almost 90% of cases, I can freely say a, per a court never saw a person that uh, they decided on which life they decided on. So there was no mention of a person being presented at court. There is no mention of person being heard at court. In 84%, there was no visual contact. In 87%, there was no even mention that the person was able to give a statement to the court. The large percentage of cases in which a temporary guardian or representative never objected to a proposal for capacity deprivation demonstrates ineffectiveness of legal representation. And this was very obvious because when there were very few cases where a person actually had a legal representative, it resulted either in not depriving that person of legal capacity or it resulted with partial guardianship, which tells us that it's really important to provide people with uh, uh, legal representation, which is why we are very much pushing now for a free legal aid law now in Serbia, so that people who are under <coughs> such procedure can at least have an independent legal representative at court. This ineffectiveness may also be related to the fact that in almost 28% of cases, a guardianship authority, which is Center for Social Work, appeared both as a initiator of the procedure that the person should be deprived of legal capacity and temporary guardian, actually representative of that person at court. So it's a double role. And Center for Social Works also have double role in controlling and exercising the role of a guardian in many cases, almost two thirds of cases. What was also very uh, obvious is that in majority of court decision, there was very stigmatizing terminology, <coughs> like Mongolian idioty, and some very offensive terms that you would never believe that they can occur in a 21st century. And these are decisions that are made between 2008 and 2009, just to give you an idea when we have the use of such offensive terminology. And also there is influence of prejudice in the assessment process. 
uh, where neuropsychiatrists are actually supposed to give an independent assessment of person on whose legal capacity the court is deciding on. However, very often psychiatrists um, dare to judge whether a person should be or should not be deprived of legal capacity, which is not at all under their jurisdiction to decide. <clears throat> So, uh, although the law is very outdated and it really requires serious changes, Serbian law allows for certain procedures that can actually uh, improve the situation while we have a legal capacity reform, and that is improvement of court practice. And this is why we actually uh, send many recommendations and are uh, planning to work with judges because judges have to afford much stronger procedural guarantees to persons against whom requests for deprivation of capacity are being lodged. So there are definitely mechanisms that can prevent such vast abuse of rights of persons who are being deprived of their legal capacity. And they can also limit the deprivation of legal capacity to the least possible extent. So they can use partial deprivation with very specific details. What are the exact uh, things that a person needs support for and what are the things that person can completely decide on their own. <laughs> So yes, we covered courts, however, practice of centers for social work hasn't been uh, researched yet. This is also vast, vast space for uh, abuses. Uh, very often it relates to property of persons, and this is definitely something we should focus on in, in our future work, uh, especially because the recent facts show that in 2011, the number of persons deprived of their legal capacity increased for one third comparing to 2010. Uh, so while we were actually counting in hundreds of people each year deprived of their legal capacity, we have thousands of people deprived of their legal capacity in 2011. So the question was, what actually led to such practice? And this is when I'm, where I'm coming back to torture prevention. So in 2009, we had a visit by a European uh, Committee for Prevention of Torture. And in their uh, report, they said that there are many people in institutions whose status wasn't regulated. So, because these people were there, considered to be there voluntarily, but there was no permission signed by them, and they also didn't have appointed guardian. So, how comes that they are being kept in these institutions against their will? So, the intention of the European commi uh, Committee was to help people, yeah? But what actually was the result that the ministry, the ministry sent uh, an order to Center for Social Work to regulate the status of people in institutions. And what we had, we had massive deprivation of legal capacity of people who are detained in institutions. We had 40 people per day that were being deprived of their legal capacity, just like that. that this is upon the evidence or the testimonies of staff that was present during these procedures. So we should be really careful why we are, when we are using uh, this argument of torture prevention, uh, how we formulate our arguments because they can really lead to serious misinterpretations on behalf of the state. 
And also what is interesting uh, in 2011, and this was for the state report, that there was not a single case of partial deprivation among all of these cases. And I haven't mentioned that in the research we did, there was only 0.5% of restoration of legal <coughs> capacity among all decisions that we uh, were able to see and also that only 5% of all deprivations were partial deprivations. So there were recent attempts for reform, both initiated by the government and the civil society sector. So the government came with a draft amendment to the law on non-contentious proceedings act. And this was tough because the working group split at the very beginning. So you had one group of people within the working group who said, OK, these are the changes we need to make. These were very superficial changes. But nonetheless, they attempted something. But the other part of the group said, no, we have perfect law. You know, nobody complains. Imagine. So then we had this attempt by coalition against discrimination, which came out with a model law and procedures for limitation and protection of certain rights and liberties. I must say that this group of organizations never consulted a single person with cognitive or any other disability in this process. And what's very interesting, that the subject of that model law is to regulate basic <laughs> principles, reasons, and procedures of adopting and abandoning decision on limitation of rights and liberties of persons with congenital or gained physical, sensory, intellectual, or emotional disability who has reduced capacity of making, understanding, or memorizing those decisions, that is, capacity of communication with others. So is there a problem with this model law? What do you think? I mean, they had great intention. They wanted to help people who had some kind of a disability. So what is the problem here? What do you think? So what's very interesting to me is that actually coalition against discrimination is coming up with a very discriminatory law because it allows people to be deprived or actually to have their rights limited simply because they have a certain disability due to which they cannot reason well or that they cannot communicate their wishes. So yes, this is very interesting, and we'll see how this will develop. So what, are, what we are planning to do, and you can see that we are really facing with different challenges, both uh, in terms of relation with the government, who thinks that situation is perfect and it shouldn't be changed, and also with civil society that thinks it's doing in the best interest of people that they actually never consulted. So on one hand, we want to make sure that the court practice is improved. And on the other hand, we want to make sure that we achieve very recent change in legislation that will allow for better protections for persons with disabilities in Serbia. So we had some activities at the national level. We continued with the monitoring of court practice. We are very pleased that people are approaching us more and more and asking for advice regarding the privation of legal capacity because they are very often advised by centers for social work and different uh, state uh, officials to deprive their children, I'm talking about parents, uh, to deprive their family members of their legal <coughs> capacity so they can actually gain some social benefits. 
And what's very interesting is that now a condition to institute, institutionalize a person is to deprive that person of a legal capacity. So there is no law that says that. It's simply a practice that's been very problematic and that we can definitely fight. So we had series of information meetings with DPOs, parents' organizations, and we tried as much as possible to involve self-advocates in all public discussions in relation to legal capacity. And also, we created a manual for persons with cognitive disabilities so that they can be more become more familiar with the issue of legal capacity and especially with consequences that such procedure is bringing. What we are very proud of is that we were able to extend this initiative regionally. First, we had a project that was called Balkan Network for Social Inclusion, which included organizations from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia and Kosovo, and I forgot, I am very sorry, Czech Republic, because your leading organization was from Czech Republic, but I was somehow uh, focusing on the region, so I, I'm very sorry that I missed uh, Czech Republic here. So uh, within this network, we actually did the research I just told you about and uh, findings of this research are in this report, Practicing Universality of Rights, which is analysis of the implementation of the UNCRPD in view of persons with intellectual disabilities in Serbia, but also we have uh, one volume that includes also Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo in the same publication. And then, we decided, and with, with the, this research, we actually identified that the issue of legal capacity deprivation is cross-cutting uh, across the region. So we initiated a person project, which we implement with our terrific colleagues from, here from Galway, uh, which we've been we, who have been very helpful with pushing for reforms with us. And we included organizations from Bosnia, Croatia, Ireland, of course, Turkey, Serbia, and Kosovo again. So we have countries from conflict region that we were actually able to gather around this idea that all persons should be recognized before the law on an equal basis with others. And we are very proud of being part of such partnership. So what we did, we managed to develop universal principles that we are all going to hold on to in our uh, advocacy efforts for legal capacity reform. We had the first regional conference on legal capacity and community living where we try to stress the importance and the link of these two issues. And also, in each country, we created national pools of expertise. And we hope to push for reforms and to involve as many actors as possible as it was done here in Ireland. So we are <coughs> learning from this experience, and we are really hoping to achieve results in very near future. Uh, you can also find person principles for legal capacity law reform on the person website, which is www.euperson.com. So these are the principles that all of our organizations adopted with a, wi with a wish to push for this reform and to have a unified voice in the whole region especially because the whole region is actually aiming to assess European Union and thus we have a additional pressure that we can put on our governments to comply with the principles and screen in the convention and actually with Article 12 of the convention. So thank you for your attention. I'll be here for your questions.
Okay, well, it's, it's quite sobering to speak about a jurisdiction like Australia and the challenges that we face, um, having just heard about the challenges um, in Serbia. Um, I'm going to talk quite broadly about legal capacity in Australia. Um, you all aware that we signed and ratified the conventions quite some time ago, um, together with the optional protocol. When we signed the convention, we made three interpretive declarations. And there is one on legal capacity that I just want to flag here, because as you will be able to see, um, this interpretive declaration is somewhat at odds with the interpretation of Article 12.4 um, that, that came forward yesterday. We said that Australia recognises that persons with disability enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects <coughs> of life. So far, so good. Um, but we declare that, Australia declares that it's understanding that the Convention allows for fully supported or substituted decision-making arrangements which provide for decisions to be made on behalf of a person only where such arrangements are necessary as a last resort and subject to safeguards. So as I say, it's a, a, a challenging um, interpretation in terms of the discussion yesterday, and I'll, I'll come back to that shortly. So when we talk about legal capacity, our common law assumes that everybody over the age of 18 has capacity, and that certain children will have capacity as well once they reach a, a particular level of maturity. Um, it's also, as we heard in Australia, like um, in England, it's not an all or nothing concept, the concept of legal capacity. Um, one, one is presumed to have legal capacity in all areas of life, but when capacity is challenged, it isn't just that you have it or you don't, you may have it for some areas and not for others. Um, and in that regard, Lucy's paper yesterday um, certainly raises a lot of questions in relation to the direction that we're heading for with law reform in the area. Um, legal capacity, it goes without saying, arises in many different areas of life and of law. And um, while I'm going to talk about guardianship law in Australia, I wanted to, to just kind of flag some of those areas. So um, contract law or tort law, marriage law, the, the, um, the level of, of capacity that is required in relation to contract law is different and somewhat higher than in relation to marriage law where capacity is challenged. Marriage law has quite a low threshold. You just really have to understand what a marriage is in, broad, in a broad context. Um, it's relevant in the conduct or the defence of legal proceedings um, and when giving evidence in legal proceedings um, around the issue of who can give evidence, how evidence is given, and the weight to be given to evidence. And the way I've structured this talk is to talk broadly about concepts, to give you um, a briefing on current guardianship law and the, what would appear to the trend in, in reform, and then to look with you at some case studies. And one of the case studies relates to actually the last three, well, not marriage law, but family law, and um, the ability of a person to who has not been found, who isn't under any kind of formal guardianship, to conduct legal proceedings or to defend them actually in the particular case study and to give evidence and what happens with that evidence. Um, mental health law in Australia has been undergoing um, reforms, or at least there have been a number of inquiries and reports. In my state, Victoria, quite some time ago, um, there was a, a very big review. There was even an exposure draft of legislation circulated. Then we had a change of government. The current state government has flagged um, broad principles, including supported decision-making, um, within a new, a new Mental Health Act, but we haven't yet 
seen the draft and having seen some of the other principles apart from um, supported decision making, I'm not particularly optimistic um, about the way in which the legislation will comply with Article 12 or many other articles in the Convention. But I'm not going to say anything more about mental health today. And then we have um, guardianship laws. Now, I can stand here, what is it, 30 years later, nearly 20, 25 years after, no, it's 28 years. Uh, anyway, but 1986, um, in the mid-1980s, Terry Carney, a professor at Sydney University, um, who was then a senior lecturer, conducted a broad, sweeping review of guardianship laws and introduced what at the time were well, made the recommendations that led to the introduction of a very progressive guardianship act, um, one at, for the time, one which um, saw guardian, plenary guardianship, full guardianship, as something which should only be introduced as a last resort, that set in place mechanisms whereby people retained their capacity um, as much as possible, perhaps you had limited guardianship where an order was made in relation to a specific issue. And all of these, um, at any time a person's capacity was challenged um, in, this, in the way of guardianship, it went to a specialist tribunal that was multidisciplinary. The person with a disability was almost always present and able to participate in the proceedings. I did a research project, uh, I don't know, about three years after um, the guardianship board was established. And was, it was very impressive to see the way in which the um, proceedings were held, investigated. People, someone from the tribunal would visit um, the person with a disability and really look into um, the issues. It wasn't just a case of a medical practitioner and a family member coming along and saying this person can't make decisions. Uh, however, over time, it's the processes have changed. The law has ch the um, CRPD has been passed. There's been a, a lot of um, calls for review. And in light of our obligations under Article 12, in light of the passage of time, um, and for various other reasons, the Victorian Law Reform Commission was asked to review guardianship law and make recommendations for change. Um, but before I get to those recommendations for change, I want to look at the current mechanisms that exist. I put supportive, not supporting or supported because these are really all forms of, or many of them are forms of substitute decision making, but the idea behind them is to engage the person with a disability. So we have a, a broad range of instruments that allow people who are legally competent um, to enter into advanced directives, to make living wills, to appoint someone, appoint their own decision maker, um, a, a vast array of instruments for this. Um, we also have a recognition of informal decision making of, in relation to everyday issues where the presumption of capacity just stands, whatever the situation, um, and a range of um, circumstances in which, I've, I've put it further down but I'll say it here, a person who's regarded as a person responsible can um, make decisions actually on behalf of a person with a disability. In criminal proceedings in Victoria, we have something called independent third persons who are required to be present when a person with an intellectual disability or some other cognitive impairment um, is being investigated in relation to a criminal matter. Um, these are not really people, that, th these people are there to support the person with a disability to the extent of making sure they understand what they're being asked, um, that they understand their basic rights, and to help the police um, to some extent by acting as a translator and, and directing the police a little in the kinds of questions that are appropriate 
to ask a person with an intellectual disability or a cognitive impairment. And other states and other places have uh, similar mechanisms um, in those criminal investigations. Um, in relation to defending or conducting legal proceedings, a person who doesn't have a guardian may come before the court and find the court appointing a litigation guardian. The, the judge may make a determination, not necessarily on a lot of evidence, um, but on their, their um, impression of what's going on, that a litigation guardian should be appointed in a particular case, in which case uh, the person with a disability loses control of the case. I'm not saying that litigation guardians will deliberately act against a person with a disability, but their role is to speak for them and make decisions in the running of the case um, on behalf of the person with a disability. So it's a form of substituted, although it's seen as supportive decision making. And then we have um, guardianship law. And as I said, the current guardianship law has a, um, a range of orders that can be made, or a range of mechanisms, all of which are substitute decision making rather than um, supported decision making at the moment. The difference between a plenary guardianship and administrator is that administrators look after financial affairs. In the 80s, that was a, a big innovation to separate out personal lifestyle matters from <coughs> financial matters um, and have a separate person deal with that. OK. So when do guardianship laws apply? When, when can um, an order be made by the relevant tribunal for guardianship and um, first of all a person and what I'm saying is broad each state has and territory has different laws although they're very similar and I've based what I'm saying on the Victorian legislation um, the person has to have a decision-making disability a physical disability is not a ground for making a guardianship order or a sensory disability is not a ground person has to have a decision-making disability and they have to have a need for a guardian. Um, the guardianship order itself has to be limited in scope to what is necessary to meet the need that's identified. Um, so there's, and then there are three guiding principles for making guardianship orders. The first is the wishes of the person, if they're known, if they can be known, what does that person want? The second is that the um, order has to be the least restrictive of the person's um, legal capacity and our dear friend best interests. It must be in the best interests of the person, of the particular person, not more convenient for somebody else. OK, so that's a broad picture of guardianship law as it stands. Um, just as we heard yesterday, in practice, often guardianship orders are, are not, decisions on a day-to-day -day basis are just made in consultation with the person or by the person, um, whether or not they have a guardianship order. One of the problems you do run into, and I speak from personal experience here, is that um, in a world where people are very concerned about legal liability and they want to know that they have a legal consent or they're concerned about privacy laws um, and their liability under privacy laws, you find a range of government departments asking for a guardianship order where a person with a disability is unable to say, speak and ask for themselves um, for a birth certificate or to make an application for a benefit, even though the, the person, the law says only to, uh, the tribunal will only appoint a guardian in restrictive circumstances, you find government departments asking for 
evidence um, that there's a guardianship order. Uh, this can be got around, but there are kind of bureaucratic processes pushing up against the practice of the law. Anyway, the road to reform. Um, as Rosemary said yesterday, when we pass, when we signed the CRPD, um, that opened the way for actually many reforms, including amendments finally to be passed for our Disability Discrimination Act, clarifying the position around the um, right to reasonable adjustment, um, amongst other things. And I'm not going to say any more about that today. Um, there has been a number of, um, there's been piloting of supported decision making practices. For example, the South Australian Office of the Public Advocate has just completed a pilot um, which is seen to be very successful around um, supported decision making. And for example, in my state, the Department of Human Services is now, uh, has supported decision making. Um, guidelines and is, in, is encouraging that practice through the different services um, of the department. But it hasn't been evaluated yet and there isn't much evidence around about it. Sorry, Rosemary? Yeah, and there's one in New South Wales as well. Um, there's also been a large number of law reform inquiries around the country. Um, and I was very excited when this started happening. I'm just a little bit concerned that the inquiries are, have not yet translated into legislation. So, for example, the example of the mental health laws in Victoria, um, there's been a number of inquiries um, into the situation of people with disabilities in the criminal justice system in New South Wales. They've had a report, but as far as I could find out, no action. In Victoria, we had this very bizarre, because I gave evidence to it, parliamentary inquiry, parliamentary law reform committee inquiry, which um, had very broad terms of reference because a number of the, um, the NGOs, um, particularly uh, women with disabilities of Victoria, had been very vocal in lobbying for it, um, but it came out with a report which, I, which doesn't really say anything, although um, many stakeholders took the time to give evidence. Um, we have the guardianship report that I've just mentioned, but only last, last week, I think? Yeah, last week the Federal Attorney General Mark Dreyfus announced a reference to the Australian Law Reform Commission on um, legal barriers for people with disabilities. Now, that's an exciting, you frowning. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's meant to be the Australian Law Reform Commission. The Australian, that's because I was thinking at the time, the Australian Human Rights Commission collected a whole lot of stories um, of people's experience of their human rights. And actually, if you're interested, there are a series of videos, some of which are. Ah. Some of which are really compelling, and one of which um, was about an indigenous, an indigenous man who had um, cognitive disabilities, who was accused of sexual offences against some indigenous girls, was found not to have the capacity to stand trial, was imprisoned 10 years, I think. He was held for 10 years before someone was actually able to clear his name, bring new evidence and clear his name, he was released, that's good, but because he had been found um, unable to, uh, not fit to stand trial, clearing his name actually hasn't been enough. The guy is living in the community but confined to his home. He's not allowed out of the line of sight of the carer who's, um, char or person who's charged with his care. So even though he was cleared, <laughs> he still 
um, subject to rights abuses. And, and I think this story has been quite influential in um, this uh, referral. At the moment, it, it's unusual, this is unusual, a, a little bit part of the nothing about us without us, but I think also partly political expediency. The, um, the reference has been made to the Law Reform Commission, but at the, in, in too broad terms, and then there's a call for members of the public to make submissions about the breadth of the inquiry and the nature of it. Um, but that's really all I can tell you about that. Oh, Rosemary's got something I, else to tell. I, I, I would just say that I was incredibly disappointed that the link to CRPT isn't strong in terms of reference. Because I think that would have been a call for submissions yeah. on the terms of reference. It would be interesting to see to what extent they respond to the call for it to be linked more strongly back to I was, the yeah. I was very disappointed about that. It just seems to me that they were in a big hurry to make the announcement and didn't actually... Um, we, you have to understand we're having an election in September and it looks like we'll have a change of government when we get that election. Um, so I think that, that this current government is very supportive of disability issues and I think they wanted to make sure that this... Um, that this Referral was well underway before, before anything happened. Okay, how am I going for time? I've got plenty more to do, so... Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I want to at least talk about one of the case studies. So I'm just going to quickly, um, I think, go through the next couple of slides. I think you'll be aware of... Bach and Kirzner's three-tiered um, system of supported decision-making. The first level being um, where there's legal capacity, a legally independent status, I should say, where no support is required. Um, a second level where, supported, uh, where support is required. And a third level that they talk about facilitated decision-making. Um, and... This model has really been incorporated, I think, into the supported decision making. Oh, okay. This supported decision making um, that's contained in the recommendations for reform by the Law Reform Commission. So there's. I'm, I'm not going to go through them all because I've given you the chapter from the um, the commission's report and they're in the slides, but there's a range of different supports where the decision-making still remains with the person with a the disability. Um, there's this level of a supporter. There's a level of a co-decision-maker that is um, appointed by the tribunal um, where the decision is to be made between the person with a disability and the co-decision-maker. And there are... Um, similar self-appointed arrangements to the ones we had before, but all these arrangements have to be um, made in writing and registered so that there will be uh, a way of proving that the person that that um, yeah an easy easy way of appro of proving the agreements, um, but the the recommended reforms retain supported decision making and very worryingly particularly in light of what Lucy had to say yesterday um, instead of them um, oh, sorry worrying to me not exactly in light of what Lucy said is that while the support the substitute decision maker is to be appointed by the tribunal um, the capacity assessment that that predates the um, tribunal hearing is to be made by registered capacity assessors. Um, if you want to read more about that, um, you can in the report. Okay. I want. To, I, I'm. I'm going to leave you to read these things because I wanted to at least come to this to this um, scenario and get some feedback from you, get you thinking about Article 12. And also, um, this, this particular story raises 
the right to home and family life. So, and this is a real case. It was reported in The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald at the end of last year. Um, Rebecca is a woman with mild intellectual disability who has a daughter, an eight-year-old daughter. Um, by all accounts, she's a competent and caring parent. <coughs> she receives some support in her parenting from the Department of Human Services, so they're very well aware of her. But her parenting ability is challenged through the family law. So the parents of her estranged partner brought an action in the family court for parenting orders. Um, and the case, when the case came to be heard in the, I think it was the Federal Magistrates Court actually, but it doesn't matter, um, the, a litigation guardian was appointed um, to act on her behalf. Now the litigation guardian was sympathetic to her. There's a trial, she gave evidence. Um, she was able to withstand, as the um, report says, three hours of cross-examination from the other side. She had three experts who were very familiar with her and her situation, testifying to the quality of her parenting ability. Now, the rest of us, when we go into the family court, well, sure, there is, is going to be some assessment of the quality of our, of our caregiving, and the court can appoint an expert to give some evidence on that. We don't actually have three experts. Um, but anyway, uh, they all agreed that she's a competent and, and caring parent. But she kind of fell foul of the test for making orders, which is what is in the best interests of the child. And I think I want to open it up to you before I tell you what, although I've kind of flagged it, what the outcome of the case is, to think about um, what Article 12 has to say about this case um, and what it, say, you know, what it says about the right to family life as well. Yes, Lucy. Oh, sorry, there's someone over there too. No, and what, what, but what's interesting to me about this, sort of speaking as a lawyer, about this particular case, one of the things, is this isn't child protection proceedings. There was no case for child protection proceedings. The department didn't seek to bring them. This is a parenting dispute, and not between the parents, but between a parent and the grandparents. I think there was another, someone else had their hand up? Oh. Sanjeev. I'm tempted to share a similar case uh, which, uh, which happened in India. A, a woman who was sexually assaulted and molested uh, in an institution. She, Became pregnant, and her pregnancy came to uh, was uh, known uh, very late. 
then legally it was not possible to go for abortion. And therefore, authorities citing uh, emergency reasons, citing her incapacity to nurture as a parent, they wanted to go for abortion. <coughs> and the matter went to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, because uh, first the matter went to High Court and then appeal, it went to Supreme Court. And uh, till Supreme Court, means that both the courts, uh, decided that the women had the parenting ability. She had the desire to keep the child. And uh, the order that with the help of an NGO or with the help of some kind of support from the state, uh, she can raise the child. Uh, her evidence was recorded uh, with the help of a doctor. Uh, and the uh, evidence was conveyed to the court. And I think that was the main uh, uh, I mean, that was the center uh, point of the judgment. Uh, but I have my own doubts about the reasoning, and we can read the judgment. Kind of. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so we have someone down here. Yeah, I know. Just two more people, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Uh, I'm from Norway, and I'm a psychologist uh, in the court in Norway in the, uh, this kind of cases. I had a similar one, and I was uh, uh, advising that the child should be with the mother because uh, it's uh, it's uh, the grandparents are not relevant. They are going to die, and the, uh, <laughs> and the emotional support is not it's not most important. Not the intellectual. Absolutely. Well, I hope that's the result. <laughs> Do you want to pass it back and then I'll, I'll tell you the outcome. <laughs> Similar to hers, but I'm picking um, the, the, where one, the, the, the facts say the, the, the mother has mild intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. So what does that exactly mean? What can she do in she that state or what can't she? Can she then two, at least there is evidence uh, from the facts that uh, she's a competent and caring parent. Then when you, I hope that's, uh, I'm believing in that. Then um, the, the principle, yes, we have the best interest of the child, but that should also be married with the principle of the parent having the primary duty, responsibility, and um, right to take care of the child against any other third parties. So, I, if I were the judge here, my fears are that, of course, they took away the child, but if I were the judge, I would say, let's empower her father, and then leave her to enjoy the, to, to enjoy the duty and responsibility to take care of her child, in the spirit of Article uh, 12 of the CRPD. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> I've got one minute, but Just very quickly, um, I've done a lot of research with parents with intellectual disabilities, particularly with mother, and with their young and adult children, and overwhelmingly the children are better off with their parents and not being removed. Many of the children were being removed, had incredible problems. While the children who have stayed with their parents seem to feel much, much better and are much happier. And they have, who have been removed are really angry about it. And often very angry about the injustices done to their mothers. Your mother is your mother. I mean, nobody chooses the mothers. But there's a very strong bond between children and parents. And it's, it's just a really bad violation, a human violation, to, to remove children. It's very easy to give support for parents with intellectual disabilities to be good parents. I mean, there's so much international research about this that I cannot understand how much the prejudice prevails. Well, this is a case that um, I'm a family lawyer by training. So if I was given this brief to read, I would say this is a shoe in. The mother is going to keep the child. And particularly in the way that our family law works, it's not a you know, mum and dad are not going to win or lose if it was between the parents, they might have to share because that, that happens a lot in our system. 
But normally grandparents are not successful in um, removing children unless there's some really um, some risk to the child. In this case, the judge didn't get to make the decision. It was actually, um, in the end, the litigation guardian and the grandparents made the decision. And, and by consent, the mother lost um, her daughter. She, she has contact with her, but she doesn't have the primary care. And the re one of the reasons I raised the case was that in the end, the litigation guardian who did support the mother was put in a position where the role of the litigation guardian and the risk to the litigation guardian of being sued led to an outcome that the mother didn't agree with. So there's, there's been um, information in the press, a lot of discussion about it. Um, it was felt that because of the best interest standard <coughs> and basically because of prejudice, from everything that we've just heard, and the evidence that went to the court was to this effect, um, she lost the child. So it's it, an example of, I think, the dangers of this kind of protective substitute decision maker legislation. Okay, I, my time is up. I'm just going, I'm, I'm flagging Patrick's story you can read the, ca the edited case, I put it on the web, it's PJB. Um, and Annie's story, I just put up because I loved Annie. Um, Annie this is Annie MacDonald, the late Annie MacDonald um, is the foundation of this particular case study. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about it later. So thank you very much and I will finish now. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, it's good to be back in Ireland. Um, okay, so having completed the masters in um, over here at, at the center, I went back to Kenya and have been working on um, yeah, have been working on um, various things to do with disability rights, particularly Article Twelve, which is what I'd like um, to tell you a bit about today. Um, okay, so a bit of background. So um, Kenya ratified the CRPD in 2008, and since I'll be talking about Kenya a bit, let me say a um, few brief facts. Population of about 40 million people. Um, human Development Index rating of 145 out of 187 countries, so that sort of gives you um, you know, a snapshot of the country. And then, um, and then, okay, so despite having ratified the CRPD in 2008, there has been continuing denial of legal capacity for persons with disabilities in Kenya, as we will see as we go along. Mostly is that even um, court decisions that have come post-2008 have not considered the CRPD at all, even when making determinations of guardianship. Um, so there's you know, that continuing denial. And then, so as a result, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, with the support of Open Society Initiative for Eastern <laughs> Africa, have been leading efforts to advance Article 12 in the country. Um, so, so the research I've been, let me tell you a bit about the research that I've been doing. Um, so it's run between April, mid-April to um, last week actually is when um, we had the stakeholders meeting for introducing the briefing paper. Um, so basically I was, um, so the, the terms of reference for the research was to document legal um, to document a briefing paper detailing the situation of the right to legal capacity in Kenya, best practices from other jurisdictions, and recommendations on how the right to exercise legal capacity can be enhanced in Kenya. So the purpose of the report then is to lay the foundation for a legislative framework for legal capacity. So um, initially, as it was envisaged, I, it was to be a desk-based um, research only. But then as I got reading, I realized that a lot of the writings were from the perspective of developed countries, 
and it feels in a way like we are all working on a puzzle and each region of the world has different pieces to the puzzle and we are sort of all bringing it together to figure out what this article 12 actually means in practice so i thought that um it would be important to speak with people with disabilities in the country and hear what article 12 means for them so, so I carried out interviews with um, seven disabled people's organizations. One of them is for people who are deaf blind, two for people with psychosocial disabilities, two for people with intellectual disabilities, one um, a women rights across disability, um, women rights organizations and organization and one the umbrella body for all um, DPOs in the country. And then I also carried out interviews with three people with disabilities and I had a focus group discussion with 16 people um, with psychosocial disabilities just to get a bit more in-depth understanding of um, psychosocial disabilities in relation to Article 12 of, uh, of the CRPD. So I mean another reason really why the interviews were necessary was because um, um, in the state report, we, our state report is right now before the CRPD committee, and in the state report, a big chunk of it is, um, is on Article 12.5, the one about property and financial control. And so this also is something that hasn't been written that much about, yet it, it felt like it's a really significant part of legal capacity in our context. So I sort of wanted to probe that as well. Okay, so, um, so this is um, so I need to emphasize that the study at this uh, at this um, at this point was very exploratory in nature. What we were seeking to do is give a snapshot to government so that to to prove that there is need to do work in this area and so to make a case for a legislative framework for legal capacity. So okay, so. Having said that, then, um, okay, so we're going to look at the policy and legislative framework on legal capacity in Kenya, and then I'll talk a bit about the Kenyan situation with regard to Article 12 of the CRPD. I'll look at a few dilemmas on implementing the right to legal capacity in Kenya, and I'll take us through a few of the recommendations that the briefing paper made. Okay, so with regard to the policy and legislative framework on legal capacity in Kenya, we have, um, it's interesting, we have laws that establish guardianship and then we have other laws that have, um, that have an impact on legal capacity without necessarily establishing guardianship. Um, but I need to say at this point that um, in Kenya it's, um, Okay, so in Kenya, yes, we have the laws that touch on guardianship, but a lot of things are done informally. A lot of things are done outside the law. And this, this was one of the challenges really when, when doing this paper, and I'll, that we will come to that a bit more, but I just wanted to alert you to, to that fact. So we have the Mental Health Act that, um, that provides for either, either full, either plenary or partial guardianship, um, so the Act uh, provides for the appointment of a manager for property in the event that a person is unable to manage their affairs in the language of the Act, or a guardian for the person. And, um, and so the interesting thing about the Act is really it gives credence to that, um, the argument that um, guardianship laws are more about property than about people. Because if you look at that Act, the bulk of it really is about property. How the, the manager should return accounts, how the manager should be removed if he mismanages the property. Nothing is said about what the guardian is supposed to do or not supposed to do. So it's, so it's very interesting that way. And you know, we'll talk a bit more about, about it. Um, then we have the Civil Procedure Code that basically lays down the procedure for um, deprivation of legal capacity, as well as providing for the appointment of a guardian in circumstances in which someone with a disability is bringing a case to court, mostly someone with, um, you know, someone in the language of the act, someone of unsound mind, but also in other provisions more general, just a person with a disability. So there is that sort of broader 
possibility of guardianship being applied beyond um, people with cognitive disabilities. And then we have the Children's Act, which provides for the extension of guardianship orders um, for a, a child with a disability upon, you know, upon becoming an adult. And then we have laws that touch on legal capacity but do not establish guardianship. So the first one is the constitution, uh, which provides that if you are a person of unsound mind, you're not allowed to vote and you're not allowed to, to be entered in the register of voters. And then we have the Matrimonial Causes Act, and it was interesting when Sanjay raised that issue of divorce, because the Matrimonial Causes Act provides that um, being subject to recurrent fits of insanity or epilepsy, in the language of the act again, is a ground for divorce. And then we have the Traffic Act, which provides that a person um, should, will not be given a license if they are a danger to the public. But how this has been interpreted is that deaf people are by and large not given licenses um, because they are presumed to be a danger to the public um, in, as far as driving goes. And then we have the Sexual Offences Act, which is on a positive note. Um, it provides for the use of intermediaries in cases where um, a person with a mental disability, again, that's, that's the language of the act, is a, has been a victim of a sexual of, you know, offense and is in court. So the intermediary may be a parent, a psychologist, who is allowed to give evidence um, on behalf of the person or to support the person in giving evidence to court. However, um, a conviction will not be reached on the uncorroborated evidence of an intermediary. So, so there's that aspect of it as well. Um, we have a Persons with Disabilities Act as well, but it does not mention legal capacity at all. Okay, so moving on to the Kenyan situation with regard to Article 12. Um, so this really, I need to say that the bulk of legal capacity happens here in the practical situation, not so much in the laws that I've talked about. So the laws are there, but by and large, when I did the interviews, the respondents were very clear that they did not know anyone who was under formal guardianship. And it's a good thing because one of the core people that I interviewed is, is actually here um, heading one of our organizations, the user movement in Kenya, he's called Michael. So in addition to me, if anyone would like to have discussions about that, um, he'd be a good, you know, a good person to speak with. Um, but yeah, so guardianship in Kenya is not common. The, reason, the reasons for this range from the fact that court processes are expensive that we have a tendency to address issues informally. Now, this is across the board. I was told, I heard from one of the participants that, um, that look, I have raised about three of my brothers, my late brother's children. I have never gone to be appointed their formal guardian. It just doesn't happen. We, you know, even land disputes, for the most part, people don't take them to court. For the most part, people sit down among families and sort of, you know, try to discuss them. It's only when it becomes very extreme that then people go to court. So this happens across the board. And so, I mean, at a point I wondered, really in this case then, is legal capacity relevant for us? You know, because clearly the laws are there, but as, as far as they are being applied to deny people of legal capacity, that's not really happening. But then, you know, at least not, not to a really grand scale. And of course, of course there is merit in reforming the laws, but really the problem with legal capacity in our context is not guardianship. So, so then when I was, so, so I was looking at it and I was thinking, okay, so should I just, you know, return this paper to the commission and say, look, we, we, do, we don't have a problem with Article 12 and, and, and that Kenya can, you know, easily go before the CRPD committee and say, we don't have a problem. We don't have a widespread guardianship system. So, so but then, then, then I thought, wait a minute, what is Article 12 really about? And that's when I remembered Professor Quinn going on about personhood 
and voice and people being able to make their own decisions and to be the determining voice in their lives and to have authority over their lives and not to have their lives dominated by others. And when I took that approach then, then the, the, the issue then became, do people with disabilities in Kenya live lives of their own choosing? Even if we do not have guardianship, do they live lives of their own choosing? Are they the authority in their own lives? And the answer was really no. So then the research had to go into that, into what are the reasons then why people with disabilities in Kenya are not making their own decisions. So, so then that's when the shift sort of occurred. Um, so you know, so those are the other reasons, the, you know, the lack of awareness. Um, again, I had to explain guardianship a lot. I'd ask, do you know anyone under guardianship? The answer would be, what guardianship? Often enough, you know, so, and this is with disabled people's organizations. So that just tells you. And then, so what then emerged is that people said, we have informal guardianship. So I said, tell me a bit about that. And the participants said that, look, if an, a decision as to whether someone would have an, um, an ECT treatment, for instance, arose in a country such as Israel or a country that has a strong guardianship system, the guardian will sign. It will give consent for the person if a guardian had indeed been appointed. In our context, it doesn't even arise to, to, for, to the doctor to ask, like, are you the guardian to this person? The doctor, the family that brings the person, signs the form quickly and the ECTs get, get done, unfortunately. That's how it works on the ground. And then with regard to people who are deaf blind, um, so I asked, how does legal capacity affect you? And the answer was that if a family is thinking of, if a, you know, so if in the, in the event of inheritance of land, what happens is that the person who's deaf blind will not be left the land in their own name, it will be left in their brother to hold on behalf of the person who's deaf blind, because the assumption is that they will not cultivate um, the land themselves. So there's this informal system in which you are deprived the, the authority to make decisions ab about your life, but it's just not done in court. That's pretty much what, what the situation is in Kenya. Okay, so, so let's go a bit into detail about what making decisions in the Kenyan context is like. Um, so we sort of look at the factors that affect the right to legal capacity for persons with disabilities in Kenya. So the first thing I came across is that we are still very much um, in the charity model of disability and that the negative societal attitudes towards people with disabilities are still very predominant. And one of the things I discovered was that people with intellectual disabilities do not, are not registered at birth for the most part. So subsequently, they find it very difficult to get documents of ident identity documents, which you need to transact in the world. So it's not that there's a law in place that says we do not register people with intellectual disabilities. It is that families, you know, just don't, you know, because of an attitude like um, in some countries, actually, it's the attitude that so a parent will say, I have four children and one child with a disability. So not counting you know, that as, as one of the children. So it's, it's sort of that, that in-depth kind of you know, negative societal attitudes. And, so, and, and the effect of this is really big. Uh, in Kenya, even to get into a lot of public buildings within the town, you need an ID. You sign in and leave your ID for, for security reasons increasingly. So without an identity document, the way in which you can engage with your environment is so limited. So that's, you know, that's one, of, one of the barriers. And then persons with disabilities live with their families in a context of limited state support. Um, we'll go a bit more into this, but for the most part, people with disabilities are not living independently in the community. They are living with their families, um, you know, and it's, you know, and, and they're, and you, okay, so let's, let's look at that um, a, bit, a bit further along. Okay, so then it's a, the context is one of poverty as well. So that has, um, that has 
implications on, on, on decision making for everybody in the country. And this is one of the core dilemmas where when people, when my friends ask me what I'm doing and I say, well, I'm doing work on how people with disabilities make decisions. Um, and so I go a bit more like financial decisions and they say, wait a minute, even I don't make those financial decisions because look, I'm still living at home with my parents. So, you know, however old I am, and it's because I can't afford to move out. So how do you really make this argument to government um, you know, about autonomy when the majority of, of the people in the country are living, you know, so this, this is one of the limits I think Jerome was talking about, about on an equal basis with others, when the others are not really that far ahead anyway. So, so you know, that's, that's been, part, that, that's been part, of, part of the problem in our context. So then, um, in accessibility of the environment, this especially, you know, this especially came up with regard to people who are blind making financial decisions. Sanjay mentioned the other day that um, he had a problem accessing a credit card. It's the same. I heard that across the board in Kenya among people who are blind. They say that banks have a fairly patronizing attitude towards clients who are blind. And they say when they apply for ATM cards, <laughs> on two occasions I heard that I had to threaten to sue for me to get an ATM card. Because the, because the banks have not constructed their ATMs in an accessible way. So control of financial decisions you know, is, is taken away because of an inaccessible environment. And then, um, and then there's limited state provision, and I'll go into a bit more detail now, that imagine a situation in which there was no, um, there was no disability allowance, no mobility allowance, and you're probably unemployed. So in that context then, the, the kind of decisions you can make, again, there's a big, you know, there's a big impact there. And I, I say limited because I need to give credit where it's due. We have recently passed um, um, a, a, pass, a social assistance act that provides for the beginnings of, um, of, of making, at least of the state giving some money to people who have, but the threshold is very high. Again, this goes on to what Anna was talking about yesterday about assessments, because it says that the person has to have a severe mental or uh, physical disability. So it isn't a situation in which the supports are already there, and it's a question of how much support do you need. In fact, it's a situation in which, from the word go, they are assessing if you're disabled enough to, you know, to make allowance, you know, to be able to get this, this support. <coughs> And then lack of alternatives came up a lot. And this was especially so in the realm of mental health care. Now in Kenya, we have, um, the mental health care is not great at all. We have one main referral hospital, which again ties up to something Sylvester was saying, uh, one main referral hospital. There, there are a few other hospitals that deal with mental health care, but for the large part, it's mainly medication. And then um, psychotherapy is too expensive for the majority of people. So at about 90 US dollars an hour, most people simply cannot afford it. And there are no other alternatives. So then what that means is, um, okay, yeah, so, so, so this really, so to, to make a choice, you're deciding between things. And if there's only one thing, then you're really not making a decision, are you? Because if there's only this one referral institution, which is an inpatient institution or hardly anything at all, that's not too much of a choice, really. And, and then the other thing that came out in the focus group discussion, actually, was that in the initiatives to provide health care within the community, abuses are still happening there as well. Because what I heard was that, well, the good thing is now we can just go to the doctor at the local um, clinic and bring him home, and then we hold the person down and inject him by force at home. So it's like, yes, you're shifting the institutions, but you're bringing the same practices in the home. So that's, you know, that's part of, 
part of what what was there. And then this one on cultural considerations was um is a really big thing because you see Article Twelve centralizes very much the will and preference of the person, but in a in a setting where communalism and family and community is is more valued than um, individual autonomy, you have attention there from the word go. And, and what I'm saying is that um, the values that get into the convention are the values that are agreed upon. So say autonomy is, is, is what found its way into the convention. But that is not to say that there are not other values that people hold dear. And this especially came up with regard to psychosocial disabilities, where the family will say, look, we are concerned about the person and we are acting from genuine compassion and that matters. And the person will say, well, I'm an autonomous human being and I want to be able to make my own decisions. But now the thing is, in a context where there are no halfway houses, so if the family is saying, take your medication, the person is saying, I don't want to. The family is saying, well, then leave. The state is saying we are hands off, and the person ends up homeless on the street. Is that the op is that the op option you want? Is that the result you wanted when you were telling people about will and preference? So this is not in any way to diminish the importance of will and preference. It is to um, to show you what it's been for me going back home to try and practice the theories that I learned here in a practical context in people's lives. And, and so those are some of the difficulties in our context. And, and yeah, so, okay, so a lot of that has concentrated with decision making us with regard to cognitive disabilities. I'll talk a bit more about what emerged from other people with disabilities when I asked them about Article 12. How am I doing for time, Charles? Four minutes. Wow, that's, that's little, okay, but we'll try. Okay, so, um, Okay, so women with disabilities and reproductive health. Okay, so across the board, people with disabilities other than cognitive disabilities and multiple disabilities have greater decision-making leeway. That came out across the board. However, women with disabilities and um, when making reproductive health care decisions, they often have those decisions made for them. I was told that people with women with physical disabilities, um, when they are expectant, it's written in their file that they will have a cesarean section. They are not allowed to carry their pregnancy to term. It's determined on the basis of having a physical disability. Um, it, it was also it was also made clear that forced sterilizations do happen, and they happen they happen across the board. So this was also why I was told this is why the commission wanted a focus on all disabilities because it was felt very strongly that in our context this denial of legal capacity is across disability really. Um, and then and then the issue of HIV testing came up where, okay, so HIV testing is a really big thing in, in Africa. Um, and at some time back, it was even a requirement, like before you could get married in, in church, before you could get married legally, now not so much. But what came out was that if you have a disability, so anyone else going for HIV test, for HIV test gets it done, no question. But if you have a disability, that the people who carry out the tests are always very reluctant to do it because they say, you're wasting our time. I mean, you couldn't possibly have HIV. How would that have happened, you know? And, and you know, so, oh, so, I mean, it's, um, it's, it, there's no law that says that they can't be tested, but it's the attitudes of the people on the ground that make this so difficult to access services. Then we talked about inaccessibility of the environment. Okay, so with regard to making financial decisions, um, inheritance of property, uh, we talked about that, and then inaccessibility of financial <laughs> services, we talked about that as well. Um, Okay, so making personal life decisions, what emerged was that uh, people with disabilities other than cognitive and multiple disabilities have more opportunities for social support outside the family. 
Uh, but I was told to be very aware of the effect of stigma on marriage, especially for women with disabilities. So what came out was that the traditional African role of a woman is to carry firewood uh, for long distances, to fetch water for long distances, to to work really, I mean, in, in a physical, you know, sort of sense. And so that if you're a woman with a disability, um, you know, wanting to get married, both your family and the family where you are intending to get married to, you will face great barriers at that point. And I, I heard across the board that women with, that this is, this issue of stigma for women with disabilities, being able to have a family life, is, is so deep, it's, it's very, very, it's a very, very big issue. And then, you know, then there was the effect of systemic diminished expectations on employment. And what I mean by this is that the participants said that when they are in schools, they are not in any way told that the world is wide open for them. What they are told is that they will be carpenters or cobblers or tailors, not that there is anything wrong with being those things, but the options for a professional career are not laid out to them. And that this happens across the board in schools. And this has a big impact on the choices that they are able to make with regard to the, to the further education they pursue and, and other things like that. OK, so these are some of the dilemmas, but really they are just a select few. There are really many. But um, one of them is, what proposals do we make for persons with disabilities who do not have families to support them, given the centrality of families in people's lives and given the lack of services, on the other hand? So what, what happens to you if you have a disability and you do not have a family to support you? What, 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 do we, what do we propose for that? And then how do we ensure that the environment is made accessible and that third parties accommodate? Really the question of how to, how to ensure that the law that is there is actually implemented is a big, big problem. And then how to ensure the centrality of will and preferences in a communal setting. Um, so then we made a few recommendations. Um, sorry, Charles. Um, okay, so one of the, so, I'll try and speak this up. Okay, so one of the recommendations was that um, it, it's important to develop a legislative framework on legal capacity, but having said this, um, in the short term, the idea is to include um, the right to legal capacity in ongoing reforms, like the Mental Health Act is, on, is, is under re review and the Persons with Disabilities Act. And then to repeal legislation that allows substitute decision making. Like, let's deal with the laws because they are there, because it's important to deal with them as well as we go into the, the, the recommendations that are going into the more pra addressing the practical situation. Then, you know, avail official statistics on, on the people, however many or few they might be under guardianship. And then, um, so the importance of implementing the convention comprehensively really came up. Um, you know, that, you know, all these things, independent living, the right to education, the right to employment, how interrelated they are, really, and how a comprehensive implementation of all of them has a positive effect on, you know, on, on all the rest of the articles, and particularly on Article 12. And then the need to create awareness on the import of Article 12, this is just so important, because as you can see in our context, the problem is on the ground rather than formal processes. So this is, this is just the most important of, 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 of them all. I mean, one of the most important of them all, and capacity building for actors such as judges, magistrates, and all the rest of them. And then the need to scale up social protection for persons with disabilities, because at least this will increase a bit of this will in, increase leeway to to make decisions that at least if you know at least if there's social protection, it, it makes things much easier for a, a bit much easier for families. And then just the provision of respite care services. Um, um, one of the things that, that comes up a lot in Kenya is our stories of people with disabilities being tied up 
and or being locked up in their homes and the the first the initial response is why would people do something like that but then when you go there and and you hear from the people they say well i i am a single parent I am not receiving any money from the state. I have to work. We have to eat. And there's no one to leave this child, particularly in urban areas. In rural areas, at least sometimes the, the community, you know, your extended family comes in. But in urban areas, there isn't anything like that. And what what options do people have? And I mean, it's um, it's not to justify it. It's to really just explain uh, what came out on, on, on the ground. And then just the need to develop alternative support measures outside the family, to develop a code of conduct for family members on how best to support their family member with a disability. Because I think for the most part, families are doing their best under really difficult circumstances. And some families really just don't know how to support the person. So I think just guidelines that NGOs such as uh, Michael's and other, D other DPOs could use use when they go on the ground to train will be so important. And then um, reform the mental health care system, I cannot, you know, this is such a big, a, a, an important um, recommendation in our context. And then build skills to facilitate Article 12, um, ensure the registration of all persons with disabilities, and then underlying all this, the need to include people with disabilities and their organizations in the reform processes. The, you know, the rural urban divide and the need for different interventions for those different places and the importance um, of gender considerations. Thank you. <laughs>